Good morning and welcome to Spain. Welcome to Brasilia. I'm very proud to introduce John Hint to you. John is a professor of fluid mechanics in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics at, at the University of Cambridge. He is also a fellow of Trinity College, a fellow of the Royal Society of London, a fellow of the American Physical Society, and Chevalier d'Ordre National du Mérite of France. He is a member of the editorial board of Physical Clubs, Journal No Newtonian Fluid Mechanics, and Granular Matter. His main research interests are microhydrodynamics, colloidal dispersion, flow through sporous media, polymer rheology, no Newtonian fluid dynamics, mobile particulate system, and applications of mathematical mathematics to industrial problems. He employs thus analytical and numerical techniques to study fluid flow problems. And the list of his publications contains more than a hundred papers published in high quality scientific journals in fluid mechanics and related areas. One of the striking attributes of John Hint's scientific work is its international character. His articles are used by scientists and engineers all over the world. His contribution to science is of great power and originality and relevance. John, thank you very much for coming and to be participating in our, in our conference. Hope we have an interesting and productive time together. We look forward to hearing your talk. Thank you very much. I'm going to tackle the more difficult problem of elastic liquids and they have, um, we've had a lot of progress in the last 20 years. In the last 20 years, experiments have become reproducible, mainly because we have some well-characterized standard liquids. Everyone can pull off the shelf the same liquid in different laboratories throughout the world, do the same experiment with a different apparatus and you should come to the same answer. The reproducibility of experiments means we know what we're trying to explain. Equally on the numerical side, it was a disaster 20 years ago, and we settled on five benchmark program problems, and then various numerical codes 
quite a really spectral, finite element with very fancy hyperbolic solvers in them. Eventually, after 10 years, we converged on the same answer. So it doesn't matter which numerical method you use, we now know how to use numerical method with these funny fluids and we'll get the same answer. So we can get answers from experiments and numerics, but getting an answer, to, does that mean you understand why we get the answer? And now because we've had 10 years of good experience from experiments and numerics, we can look back and say, why do we have to have these answers? Why was it inevitable the answer was like this? So I support you that uh, these complex fluids are halfway between viscous liquids and elastic solids, but they are not, uh, but your understanding of viscous material and elastic material does not help. That uh, they are not halfway between. There are some very strange things happen which you couldn't have anticipated from your knowledge of fluid behavior and solid behavior. Okay, so my talk is I'm going to tell you about four difficult problems to understand. I'm then going to use a particular model, and it's the simplest possible, and see whether that particular very simple model can help us predict and help us to understand why we have the problem called old Roy B. It is not fully successful, but you can examine the failure and decide what do I need to correct. Once you can predict something good and something bad, you get iterating and improving your modeling. It's a subject where you don't know the governing equation like we do in mechanics or soft mechanics. Um, we have to model scientifically what is going on. And at the end I'll be able to say, well, while I look at particular equations that govern the behavior, the details didn't matter. It was inevitable you got certain phenomena. Okay, there are four flows, um, I'm going to look, show you in detail these four different flows which we are going to try and understand. So the first one is um, a contraction flow. The fluid is starting at the top and going at the bottom. It's starting in a wide channel, in a wide pipe and going down to a small hole. And upstream there are these large recirculating vortices. So in normal fluid mechanics it's the other way around that if you come out of the small hole and go upwards, you would have recirculating eddies. But this is wrong way around. As you go down into the hole, you have these recirculating eddies. They're very dangerous in synthetic fiber manufacturing because the fluid in here is at the temperature and it's cooking. And it's different to the material that goes quickly through. And if there's a pressure fluctuation, and a bit of these eddies escape um, into the synthetic fiber, you get a, a strain of the wrong behavior in fiber. I was asked by the company Courtauld, why could they not make dye stick onto the fiber to make colored fiber? It would stick on some places and not others. And the reason was some of this material was escaping. So we'd like to understand why is it happening and stop it. Associated with these large eddies is the pressure you need to drive the fluid through, the pressure um, suddenly jumps as the flow rate increases by an order of magnitude. Okay, flow parts per stick. This has very little engineering importance, but all theoreticians say how do you solve flow parts per sphere? And there are experiments of it. So what do you find in flow parts per sphere? I suppose it's typical of using the take your understanding of this to talk about flow past more complex objects and flow through porous media if you're interested in flowing or in reservoirs. So we find if we move the sphere sideways at a high velocity, there is a very long wait. This is the velocity as a function of position. And associated with these long weights, there is a small increase in drag, a 30% increase in drag has increased with the velocity. There's also a possibility of negative weight. So normally if you have a, a, a big bar of fluid and we have a sphere and we move it this way, sorry, move it this way, then the material behind will move with it and slightly slower. In these strange materials, if you move the sphere this way, the fluid goes that way. A negative weight. Ah, yes. 
the M1 project. People would say that the complex behaviour is all due to extensional viscosity. So, um, 15 years ago, we had a project, an international project, to try and measure the extensional viscosity. And Magic Liquid 1, made at the University of Monash, that's why it's called M1, was sent around to a dozen laboratories in different countries and with different apparatus, um, there are eight different apparatus here, they tried to measure the extension of viscosity and you see they found rubbish. There's no such thing. That's nearly true, that's it. Uh, right, so here are the uh, three, I've got one to do. Um, and unfortunately with modern technology you will not see this experiment that I mentioned before. So I need some complex fluid and a very cheap apparatus. So here's the cheap apparatus, my fingers, and the complex fluid is here. I'm going to put a little drop of uh, my saliva between my fingers and open my fingers. I form a liquid bridge and it is there now and it's gone. You can try this experiment. It will last, I guarantee, in a second or two. In people's water, it's a millisecond. So, uh, this liquid in our mouth, which is very much like water, you couldn't eat if it wasn't really like water, but it has a strange, funny property, which actually also helps you. And there's some more things I have to explain later. Okay, so, we're in a quantitative science, we have to have some equations. I promise you will not see many equations. I will not solve any equations. And there, there's probably five altogether. So the equations say in a very quick way, what's our, what, what is happening? So we're going to conserve mass, we have momentum. The big problem is that the stress depends on the velocity gradients in the flow, but we don't know this relationship. 